hello everybody. I hope you're all doing reasonably well. Uh, this week I thought I'd do something a little bit different. Uh, I'm going to be talking with my good friend and photographer Alistair Ben. So stay tuned for that conversation. I think you'll find it really interesting. Now before we start that conversation, I just wanted to mention that the F4 group and I, which comprises of Thomas Heaton, Gavin Hardcastle, Nick Page and also Greg Snell, uh, we're all working really hard at uh, editing uh, these videos for the video course that we're putting out. Now originally we were going to put it out in the fall, but we've decided to move it ahead quite a few months. So stay tuned for that. If you'd like to know more information or keep up to date, be sure to sign up for our newsletter in the link down below. But in the meantime, before I get to Alistair, I just wanted to show you a quick behind the scenes video of what we were up to in January with the F4 group. All right. Whoa, 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 whoa. Wait. Oh yeah, dude, this is where it's at. Awesome. Okay. This is uh, high budget filmmaking. Action! So uh, Nick drove the wrong way and he's now turning around in a very, very tight spot. One way or the other way. Hey, nice job, Nick. That was quite tight. I like it tight. <laughs> well, that's like a, that's like a full uh, face. Uh, yeah, that has to droop <laughs> off the back. How about that? What, what, like a rest what do you put in there? You drugs? <laughs> like a night hat. Yeah, there's a kind of store thing. down the road here. Really Gavin, think? reaction? You think it's I guess it has to accommodate your, your extra brain. Though. You gotta, you gotta have it hanging up like this. Kind of looks like a, like a cone head. Bang it around a little bit. <laughs> How's that? I think you should buy it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a no then. <laughs> yeah, let's get our bags. Hey, will you hand me my Shimoda? My Shimoda? My Shimoda? How about my Shimoda? <laughs> my Shimoda! <laughs> We should have kept that going a bit longer. <laughs> so ridiculous. <laughs> All right, and hello, Alistair. Hi. How Adam. you doing, mate? I'm doing great, man. Nice to see you again. Yeah. So, uh, how's isolation for you? I'm actually quite enjoying it, to be fair. Um, <laughs> uh, getting time to be at home in front of the computer uh, is a rare luxury. You know, we we spend so much time traveling and running workshops and so forth. It's kind of nice to just be able to do a bunch of stuff that I just don't have time to do normally. So, I'm I'm writing a new ebook. Uh, which is going well. So yeah, I'm, I'm getting all this stuff done that I don't normally get to do. So I'm, I'm quite, all right. yeah, quite enjoying it. <laughs> so now, what part of um, uh, Scotland do you, you live not too far from Glencoe, right? Yeah, if, um, if the ferry was, was running properly, we'd, I could get into Glencoe in just over half an hour. Uh, so the western side of Glencoe anyway. So yeah, we're, we're kind of out towards the Ardnamurchan Peninsula, which is the furthest west point of Scotland. Uh, we're surrounded by beautiful oak woods. Um, we've got the sea quite close to us. Uh, it's very, it's kind of remote and small. The village only has like about 400 people. So yeah, it's beautiful. There's worse places to be isolating. <laughs> You and I met quite a number of years ago now. Uh, some people might not be familiar with you, so maybe just tell us a little bit about your your photography and 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 that kind of thing. 
and how you how you got into it. Right. Um, well, well, we'll start at the beginning then. I, I, I photographed when I was a kid, when I was a teenager. I shot film, slide film, uh, as a teenager in Scotland uh, without any knowledge of any technique at all. I just pointed my camera at things that I liked. And then obviously life gets in the way and you end up getting a career and doing sensible things. And it was in the early 2000s that um, I got back into photography and it was bird photography that, that first got me back into it. I, I was living in the Far East and um, I was seeing a lot of beautiful bird photographs from the rainforests and stuff. So it was about then that I, I kind of got myself a big lens and a digital SLR, a Canon 10D I think it was. And for the, about the first five or six years it was almost exclusively birds that I was interested in. But when I was traveling to other places like Canada, for example, I was in Canada in 2003 in the fall and started taking landscapes just because I started seeing photographs of landscapes that kind of resonated with me somehow, particularly night photography. I saw a couple of nice uh, night shots from around Kananaskis country um, that, that kind of just, ooh, that it was a kind of, it kind of sparked off this sort of interest in my mind about landscapes. Uh, and then it was in the, about 2007, 2008, I was living in the Himalaya by that point in time. I was living in Tibet, more or less, uh, and spending a lot of time in the mountains there. And it just seemed like this natural progression for me to start shooting at night in the Himalaya. Uh, and then I ended up writing a book about night photography because there was just no information out there about the Yeah, yeah, I have, I have that book. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, the, the Did you pay for it? <laughs> uh, I, I think I did actually. Yeah, I think Excellent. I did. <laughs> Bring it on. <laughs> uh, so I wrote that book and, and it did really well. It was kind of the first night photography book that wasn't talking about rules of thumb. Uh, and it did really, really well. It sold tens of thousands of copies. Uh, and wow. before, I re before I really knew it, I was making a living as a landscape photographer. And education for me was always a draw. It was... I felt disillusioned about the way landscape photography was taught uh, and I, 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 since I started the YouTube channel last year, my main drive I think has been to sort of come at, come at the teaching side from a different angle, you know, from not 90 yes. degrees but maybe even 180 degrees to just try and, I want to bring back feeling and emotion and the the, pa the 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 process of being in the landscape and loving the landscape and learning more about ourselves through the pastime of photography. So uh, I think that's where you and I are similar. So y you and I met, I think it was 2014, uh, yeah. in Mount Assiniboine, uh, yes. where you and I had spent a very enjoyable five or six days together. Yes, and I, I, uh, I remember that well, because I actually ran in and out and it's a good yes. 20, 20 odd kilometers, but it was just a great run. Um, it started off really sunny and then it, the weather <laughs> gradually got really bad as it got to the pass and it was snowing and I'm it standing there in my, in my shorts. But uh, yeah, and we'd never actually met in person before. So I came, I remember coming to the cabin there and you're sitting there with Juan Lee and you kind of look at me and I go, how's it going? And you go, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> Madam, <laughs> oh yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah, it was that was mad. That was just absolutely mad. Yeah, it, it was it was an, a really awesome time, and the, the the conditions that we got at the time were just amazing. Well, it's funny because I've I've been to a cinema in a lot, uh, you know, several times over the years, and I think that trip I got the best shots ever on that trip. Like not just one, but three or four really yeah. great shots from that one trip. Whereas other trips I've been and I've been skunked every time. So yeah, it was I a good know. it was a good trip. Yeah. I, th I think me helping you out probably, probably was that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> probably. <laughs> so, so you have a, a YouTube channel. Um, I do. Which you've had for quite some time, but you've just, well, since this virus thing, you've really started to uh, amp it up and, and get more videos out. And you've started uh, Vision and Light, which, I, which I've been on a couple of times. And uh, so tell us a little bit about kind of what the what the idea is behind that well vision and light really came about through just you and i talking quite regularly uh on whatsapp or facebook or whatever uh and we we i just kind of thought that what we were talking about was really contemporary landscape photography just when you and i were just you know chatting anyway uh, and i just thought this is probably quite useful 
just in the broader sense, you know, because there's there's so many stuff on on YouTube about gear uh, and you know gear reviews and the kind of the same old same old type of compositional theory and all of this type of thing. Mm -hmm. And I just felt that where you and I are similar is that we both come at it from a slightly right field angle where our, I think our photography is kind of innate uh, to a certain extent and we share an awful lot of the same uh, visions, but our photography is very different. Uh, but our process is, is very similar. Uh, not processing, but the, the, the process. Yeah, the process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, the process rather than the processing. Um, and what I've found, because uh, the other people who've been on the show so far are Sean Bagshaw from Oregon, and then yesterday's episode, or Wednesday this week's episode, was uh, Mark Adamus. Uh, right, which I'm sure, um, but there's probably a lot of people watching now that know of Mark, but never actually seen him because he hardly ever goes on social media. In, I think he has no. an in, Instagram account. I think that's about it. He isn't does, it? yeah. So uh, if, if for those of you that don't know Mark, you should definitely go and check that one out because uh, it's a very rare, <laughs> rare appearance by Mark. I, I think it's the only video of Mark on the internet. Well, probably because episodes. he's been forced to stay inside, so he has no choice, Absolutely. you know? <laughs> yeah, I, I just pounced on him. <laughs> but the, what's, what's coming across from this whole thing is that having spoken to you and Sean and Mark and then I'm speaking to Theo Bosboom uh, for next week's episode. Oh excellent. Uh, and Theo's an incredible photographer and what's coming out of the whole thing is that all of us share very similar attributes in terms of our approach to the landscape but the photographs we make are all completely different. Yes. Um, and, and that for me was kind of what I suspected was going to happen Get, well, partly given the people who I'm speaking to, perhaps, because all, I think we're all kind of, we're quite distinctive in a way. We're not very homogenous. Yes. Uh, but, but what I wasn't really expecting was the humility that everyone is demonstrating, uh, just our willingness to listen to the landscape, uh, our willingness to be influenced by our own mood and the mood of the landscape and and finding some kind of, I'm going to use lots of hippie language, like sort of resonance, man. <laughs> just don't use the journey on my journey. I, I, for whatever reason. I, I'll, 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 I'll try and avoid that one. <laughs> I don't know why that bugs but, me, but just anyway, yeah, keep going. <laughs> it, it, it's your show. It's your show. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's proving to be really successful. It's now also... Uh, available as a podcast on Podbean and it's on iTunes now. Uh, so people search for Vision and Light on either of those platforms, it'll come up. It's going to be on Spotify reasonably soon as well. Um, but yeah, it, it's turning into kind of a weekly thing. Yeah, so you'll be you'll be having. I mean, you and I will go. will be on somewhat reg. More, well, kind of on a regular basis, maybe once a month or so, and then you will have other guests on there just to. So it doesn't get. Bananas. <laughs> I mean, it, the, I, I want it to remain true to that original thing, which was it was you and I chatting sure, and, yeah. and being friends and hanging out. Uh, but I think having other people on is is allowing for this diversity of opinion to come in. Yes, uh, and it also gives us stuff to talk about because something I might have talked about with Ad, uh, with with Mark or Theo or Sean or whoever. I'm talking of Guy Tal as someone else who who I'm lining up to have a chat with as well. Right. Uh, so this diversity of opinion, I think, is really useful and it, it's going to give us more fuel to discuss other things in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so let's move on to the next thing. So the the last time we talked on your on, on Vision and Light, we came up, or well, you came up with the idea that perhaps we take an image or two of one another's and try processing each other's images to see kind of what we would come up with. So you sent me two images. I sent you two. Now, did you end up processing one or two? I only processed one of them oh. so far, but I can certainly process <laughs> was, the other. That was probably enough. Eh? <laughs> I haven't been feeling well this week. Right. I, I, I've been I have been feeling a bit under the weather, uh, so I I I only processed one of them. But but I really went to town on it, and I did talk a lot. About it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. So 
the images that uh, we ended up processing, uh, actually Alistair has the same images image on his screen right now. That's one of your images. Uh, yes, now, it is. I, I have to admit, Alistair, I was a little bit, I was a little disappointed because you sent me some images that really didn't need much doing to them at all. <laughs> and the reason being is that the light is just, just beautiful. And uh, what I'm finding, and I've, and I've mentioned this a, a few times in some of my videos, is that if you really don't like processing, then I would highly recommend that you photograph in good light. Because <laughs> the, the, the better the light, the, the, you know, the less likely you're going to have to do that much to your photography. And uh, when I was processing this, I, I even noticed that you used uh, like a, 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 a split grad filter, which yeah. Some a lot of people aren't even using it anymore because they're just doing everything in processing. But I think now I could be wrong here. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. I think probably one of the reasons to use a filter like that is so you're doing as much in camera as possible so you don't have to do that stuff afterwards. Is that kind of the gist of it or was this an older image? The, no, this this is just from October last year, so it's it's still quite quite contemporary. Uh the reason I used a filter in this case is um, I, I've spoken an awful lot about trying to uh, get rid of judgment in our photography. Mm -hmm. And what I've realized is, is that as soon as we push the shutter and look on the back of the screen, we're making a judgment. It's, it's an instantaneous, oh, yeah, I like that. I'm, I'm happy with what's going on here. And I think what I've done is I've gone back to using grads for two reasons. One is I'm sponsored by Case. Oh, <laughs> so, um, oh. oh well. <laughs> so I, I, yeah, I noticed that I, really <laughs> horrible color cast in that. <laughs> <laughs> right, so partially the, the main reason I use filter still in the field is to give me that kind of dopamine hit when I look at the back of the screen. Yes. And by balancing the exposure, it, it, it just allows me to see something almost with a better understanding of what the whole thing's going to look like to a certain extent. So I, I think photography is an aesthetic driven process. You know, it's, it's driven by looking at something in the field. And then when we do see the back of the screen, there is that kind of instant, oh yeah, this is working yeah, for me. Yeah, definitely. And the, the other thing obviously here is the shutter speed. The shutter speed is a very important element in this photograph yes, as well. Yes. So what I'm going to do is uh, I won't, I, because I processed this image and I and I did a screen uh, record of the process, so I'll I'll add that as a separate video for our viewers. And um, right. now, have you done? You've did also did a processing video of this one or or not? No, I haven't, but I will. Okay, so we'll we'll do, we'll put two videos together, and uh, we'll put those on either your or my channel or or both, and then. While I'm processing it, I'll talk about why I'm doing what I'm doing rather than dragging this this video out because otherwise it will just go on for sure. hours. But in a, in, a, in a nutshell, I mean, I I mean, well, both images you sent sent me were spectacular, and I really didn't have to do much to them. So I was actually forcing myself to find some some way that I could actually, <laughs> you know, uh, make something a little bit more than just the, the photograph that I saw in front of me. Now I know you you're a little bit uh, well, you used to be not so much uh, quite heavy-handed with the the moodiness of your images. Has that kind of changed a lot over the years? I don't know what, I don't know. Um, it's not really I, heavy hands. What, what would it be? It would, I remember a lot of your images used to be very dark and, and brooding and. I, I became a very technical photographer, uh, probably in the it's sort of late 2000s, early, early, whatever they're called. What, what, the, what the 21st or the 2010s called? Whatever they're, whatever they're called, the early 2010s. Um, and I, I just, it was more of an, ex, an exploration of technique. Uh, we were still struggling to blend exposure as well. Uh, so I got really into the kind of luminosity masks yeah. and blending and, and more technical photography. And then hanging out with Mark Adamus and stuff in Tibet, you know, you kind of get influenced by his process right. and that. So yeah, I, I, I did. And, but the reason I made dark images was I was really depressed. Uh, you know, okay. I, was, I, I was really, no, I mean, there's times in your life where, where it just gets heavy on you. And I, what I did with my photography is I found a way to, to, to express my, 
mood without whinging about feeling down all the time. But I could express that kind of heaviness of heart to a certain extent through dark images. Um, but I always tried to infuse them with a, with a, with light, with luminosity. So there was a very a very strong feeling of hope because I've always been very optimistic. And over on my channel, very much the whole focus of it is the emotional aspect of the communication of what we right. do. So I believe I believe that the geometry the layout of our images has a fingerprint, has a mood, the distribution of light, the distribution of color, the distribution of contrast. So all of these different things are triggers that, that are kind of uh, ways to tap into the emotional aspect of photography. So long exposures are obviously calmer than short exposures in, in this particular case. The way I processed your image um, was I looked at the psychology the underlying psychology of the composition, uh, which was, well, I mean, we can talk about that when we get to it, I suppose, but I, I made it darker because it, it was talking to me. When, you, when you're looking at a photograph that you didn't take, you don't have a connection with it immediately. Right. You know, yeah. you, you've, you've almost got to try and work out, well, what, well, A, it's not so much why did you take it, but what is the content saying to me was was my kind of approach. So when I did the screen recording, I was very much thinking about the psychology of the visual design. So the fact that it goes from bottom right to top left, the fact that you've got all this chaos up in the top left hand side, yeah, yeah. The, the main source of light is coming through from the back. Uh, there isn't a huge amount of depth to it, so everything's quite compressed. Yes. Um, and if, so what I went down the line of was saying, well, there's a kind of slightly claustrophobic feel to the geometry of it. Uh, okay. And what, and what I started to do was to, to try and demonstrate that by darkening it and cooling it, that claustrophobia would be increased as a feeling. Uh, and then I went on to flip it uh, 180 degrees so it pointed in the other direction and then I warmed it up and made it much more open and light. And really what... what the processing you've done on your version is the processing I would have done if it was flipped the other way because it would have been oh, really? naturally more joyful. Interesting. Uh, whereas, whereas you've just said, no, this is joyful to me. And it's almost like your emotions have, have allowed yourself to have a very different relationship with it based upon probably your love of this this environment. Whereas for me, this is a very claustrophobic, unfamiliar environment because I don't spend a lot of time in Calado uh, sort of uh, Vancouver Island rainforest. Right. Uh, where most of my habitats are way more open and kind of uh, less confined. So yeah, it's a very, it's a psychological. Yeah, I mean, they're to to totally different. And, and out of all the, the images, the, these, uh, these two versions were definitely the, the most strikingly diff different <laughs> yeah for sure i think whoa that's pretty <laughs> i don't you know, want to go in there i don't want to go in that woodland <laughs> well right that right but but you know <clears throat> this book i'm writing at the moment part of it is the psychology of how we respond visually to things um it's going to be called the meaning uh, the, the the color of meaning is going to be right. the name of the book uh, and realistically what i'm doing when i'm writing these books is i'm processing an image one way and then i'm changing just the color uh, or the luminosity and it changes the feel of the image completely and if we took your version of this and darkened it by a stop and a half it would feel different yes yes yeah so, i remember uh, when i went to that was in on uh, near Carmana, which is on the west coast of Vancouver Island, with my friend Jeremy, and uh, I remember both of us were. I mean, the weather was was not nice. The light was flat. It was it was uninspiring, and I, I know that Jeremy had a heck of a time because he he struggles a little bit with woodland photography, and that was one of the reasons why right. he was there to try and get him get himself motivated. And I I saw this uh, this scene, and I just I just thought it was absolutely fantastic. So. It when is. it came when it came to processing it, I I just felt so happy, you know, because I I mean the there was snow coming down and and I, I do that with a lot of my my processing. I try to I actually have my my shadows are usually quite open. Um, right. Very very rarely do I do really dark shadows. Uh, I I open them up because I I just like to, that free that 
open, free effect, um, light, lightness. Um, and uh, so, yeah, when I saw your version, I went, wow, that's, <laughs> that's probably <laughs> and, how Jeremy the, the, felt. <laughs> but the thing about it is, is it's, it's, <clears throat> it's a human nature thing to judge. You know, pe people are going to look at these two images side by side and they will judge and they will, they'll prefer one to the other. And I'm, I'm, I'm totally prepared for that to happen because I think your version is definitely more accessible. It's more open. It's more joyful. Um, but for me, it, I, I don't judge or I try not to judge. What I try and realize is there's a consequence of what we're doing. Sure. So the, conse the consequence of my processing is that the image will be less accessible. Mm -hmm. it, it will be darker, it will feel more sinister, it will feel feel moodier, uh, whereas yours feels joyful, airy, optimistic, happy. Um, right, and, and as you said, you know, I mean, I mean, you weren't there, so you don't have the same uh, attachment to, to the photograph as I do, for sure. I mean, you've never been to that area, um, not that I know of, and uh, no. so, so, you know, why would you have any kind of attachment to it um, other than you might say, well, this is a, a pretty picture. Um, now, your image, on the other hand, your your other one from the Isle of Skye, I have been to that area. Yeah. Uh, that was the uh, uh, El Elgol? Is it El Elgol? Elgol Beach, yeah. I have been there, so I recognized it straight away, and I actually recognized the, uh, the cliff on the side there. All right, so this photograph here... Uh, like I said, it, this is very similar to the other one. I mean, the light is absolutely beautiful. So I, I didn't really feel like I, I had to do much to it. And, and I had a bit of a hard time because I'm trying to think, like you said, with the last image, uh, I'm trying to think, okay, well, what direction would I would I take this? And uh, I couldn't really <laughs> think of anything other than just process it to, to make it, um, just add a little bit of contrast. I mean, there is one section where... The sky was definitely quite a bit brighter up in the left yeah. corner, so I, I, I spent quite a bit of time on that. And uh, I really wanted to emphasize the, the light on the, on the peak in the background, because that's where your eye tends to, to be drawn. So I, I'm all about brightening the areas where I want people to look and darkening the areas where they're not that important to me. So. But the overall image is really beautiful. So, yeah, I had a bit of a hard time. So I, I, I did a bit of dodging and burning, but it didn't really take it in any direction. And maybe I didn't need to. You know, it's just a, it's a really great image. So, I, be, I sometimes we can overthink things as well, right? Well, like I said before, with the the first of my two photographs, is that I think the content in its own right has uh, an emotional fingerprint to it. You know the the just the geometry of of the way the rocks are interacting with the water, and then obviously you've got a big pointy, beautifully sunlit peak in the background. So it's obvious that that's the destination of all of this content to a certain extent. Um, yes. And I think the differences between the two is I cropped mine a little bit more. I pulled mine in from the top left hand corner as a square, and right. and got rid of the water on the bottom left. Uh, to, to, to try and confine things a little bit more. And the, the secondary component of that is it's brought the mountain more into the center of the frame, whereas yours is still off right. to the right-hand side of the frame. Uh, so- Yeah, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't no, cop it at all. No, I, I can um, see that. I just left it. Um, so I, I think as soon as you crop that, the mountain gets bigger because it takes up more real estate mm -hmm. in the frame. So I think everything I did, and again, I, I kind of went to town a little bit more in the processing video. I mean, I was using luminosity masks and various bits and bobs to try and, um, to try and draw the eye through to that mountain as, as much as possible. Um, but yeah, the, 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 our principles of processing are very similar in that you, you bring in detail to the front and you, you allow depth to be more apparent in a two-dimensional surface. Uh, this is something I was talking to Mark yes. Adamus a lot about in, in this week's show, um, is that we have, a, whenever we're in the landscape, we have an experiential, uh, a three-dimensional, 360-degree, five senses working overtime, uh, giving us all of this stimulation, you know, the sound of the waves and birds flying over and wind in your face. And you've, you've got this kind of experiential relationship with it. And then as soon as you bring it into Lightroom, for example, you're just back with a two-dimensional surface again, 
so yes. you, it's almost... I, I agree. I mean, that we, I mean, you talked about it at the start of the show that if you've got great light, you, you tend to need to do less. But at the same time, uh, rationalising raw files into something that's kind of lucid and concise and articulate is, is still a skill. Um, you know, and yes. your processing is amazing. I mean, it's, you know, I've, you're not International Landscape Photographer of the Year for nothing, you know. <laughs> it's, well, it's, it's, ta it's, take, it's been very painful to, because um, I, I my, my Photoshop skills are definitely, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say they were adv are advanced by any stretch of the imagination. Actually, I, I use the very basics, but I think where I've tried to, I think the experience that I've had, because I've been using Photoshop since, since it came out, Photoshop yeah. one. <laughs> so it's been, I don't know how many years that is 100. now. Uh, but I think the difference is, is that I, I usually know what, where I want to take it and I'll find a way to do that. Uh, I'll, I'll be uh, I'll be honest with you, and I probably sh maybe shouldn't be saying this, but a lot of the times, some I, I won't know how to do something in Photoshop, so I'll go straight to YouTube and and <laughs> watch a video about how to do a, something a certain something way. Something that was really apparent when when I came to your house in 2014 <clears throat> is that I was always a more technical processor. I'd spent a lot more time investing in that, whereas you just used to spend your time investing in being out. Um, so. Right. I think I did put a lot of time into the sort of techniques that were available. And, and what you tend to find is that there's there's five or six different ways to do anything, you know. Oh, definitely, definitely. And, and, and I uh, think the advantage of learning <clears throat> multiple techniques is it gives you this this freedom to, to skip in between them at will. And I, I just default to the easiest way to do it. It's my, my brain will just say, yes. right, what's the fastest, easiest way I can achieve what I want to achieve? And what's happening more and more these days is the answer to that question is Lightroom. Uh, and I do way more in Lightroom than I ever used to do because it can. You know, I can even use basic luminosity yes. masks in Lightroom now with the range mask function on the gradient and the brushes and stuff. So what, what I realized when I started writing this book was that when I need an image to illustrate a point, I'm doing it in Lightroom. Uh, because it's quick and easy and efficient. And now with the basic range mask facility, you can you can kind of make really amazing uh, adjustments, dodging and burning adjustments, both globally and locally with a huge amount of precision now. So I only tend to go into Photoshop if there's more advanced work needing done, where it's really precise, where I need to make very specific adjustments or things like warping, uh, you know, to, to to change sort of visual relationships a little bit or something like that. Right. That that's a more kind of right. But apart from that, I mean, the the whole Photoshop environment tends to be quite confusing for people. So Lightroom is by far an easier way to go. Yeah, it's a bit more intuitive, isn't it? It's just there. It's just everything is there in front of your face, and you don't have to worry about layers and all that type of stuff. But the principles are always the same. I, I always <clears throat> say to people in workshops, you should really be able to get. 85 90 percent of the way to the final version of an image quite you know in in lightroom and and not in a terribly long amount of time you know five ten minutes uh you know just to kind of capture that mood that feel that kind of the color space you know the, the the general feel of an image but yeah yes so when you uh when you're out in the field taking photographs uh do you uh do you instantly know what you're going to do when you get that file back home? Or is it something that you work on when you open up the image and go, oh, I can do this, I can do this? Like, do you actually pre-visualize or, or is it a, a kind of a combination of, the bo of both? Because I find myself, I find that the, the scenes that I actually pre-visualize where I can see what I'm going to do to it when I, when I get home with the post-processing actually end up being more successful for me than the ones where I'm just kind of second guessing myself until I, you know, open it up and then I... I think that's different. I mean, it. something I'm such a huge advocate of is that there's no rules in terms of it has to be this way. You know, I, I think the more open we are to saying everything is valid, you know, so that approach <clears throat> of pre-visualization is valid. An approach of no pre-visualization is equally valid. 
if it works for you, Fair then enough. it's good. Yeah, as far as I'm concerned. I think we should be finding the way that works for us and not assuming that something that works for somebody else will work for us. So finding our way, and this is exactly what Mark Adams was saying this week, is that he had to find his own way because he doesn't learn easily. So he had to develop okay. his own methods. So in terms of the whole pre-visualizing thing, I tend not to when I'm in the field. Um, okay. And part of that came about from that trip to Assiniboine where we had incredible light and we had such beautiful atmosphere and and you and I were having a laugh and it was a really significant time in my life um, and because of workshops and other commitments it was about six months before I got to look at any of those photographs and by the time I sat down in front of the computer I was in this mindset of historically approaching image processing as a well you have to try and capture the feeling of when you were there. That, that's part of what a photograph is, is, is a kind of, yes. it's, it's somehow a, a summary of your relationship with that content now and when you were in the field. And what I found six months after the event was I, I had no recollection of how I'd felt particularly. Uh, and who I was as a person had changed. Um, I'd, I'd kind of, evolved creatively from the person I was when I actually pressed the shutter button. Uh, and what I found then very plainly was that the who I am when I'm sat in front of the computer processing the image is has more bearing on the outcome of the photograph than right. the person I was when I pressed the shutter. Um, now, I think the way you tend to work quite a lot of the time is you go into the field and you're processing the images quite soon after, uh, particularly for your, yes. for, particularly for the YouTube uh, channel in particular. Well, it's yeah, it's um, it's forced me to because I'm doing the YouTube videos. Uh, it's forced me to, I, I pretty much process them as soon as I get home. Yeah, and of course, it doesn't always work out because I, I get quite excited when I'm out in the field and I get home and I open them up and I go, oh yeah, this is great, this is great, and then. <laughs> A few days later, I'm looking at it. And I go, what was I thinking? <laughs> and then it and then it takes a. I mean, you usually know you know when you have a really great shot. I you agree. just know it. But there's other times where because I'm doing these videos, I'm really I'm really uh, polishing a turd basically. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm out there and I'm struggling, but it it's forced me to really to really look, and uh, it's an interesting thing and of course not every image is going to be uh, fantastic but I don't think my audience expects that they just want to kind of engage it with me and going outside and 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 telling people what I'm looking for and, and why and uh, yeah. but yes I, I, I process the images pretty much as soon as I get home well that, whereas I know some different. people yeah it's a very different thing um, so that that feeling is I mean, it's still with me. I mean, I was just out in the woods an, an hour ago, and now I'm at, at home, yeah. <laughs> looking at the images, you know. Whereas I think, but usually I, I can't I can't wait to get to them. I'm really excited about getting to them. Well, that's right. But the, you know, the bottom line is is that my my approach to photography is before I had the YouTube channel for 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 a start, it was very different. I mean, it's always been very <laughs> education driven. I mean, I've been running workshops for nearly a decade, and it yeah. yeah. The, that workload, I mean, being in the field that much, I mean, I, I, I shoot just 50 times more than I ever process. Um, yeah. So the ones that I do process, it, it tends to be, they are somehow resonating with the version of myself that's sitting in front of the computer when I see it. Uh, so I might have a Lightroom catalog of X number of photographs and it's just like, oh, right, that one's speaking to me today because I'm feeling, okay. uh, joyful or I'm feeling yeah. uh, melancholy or I'm feeling stressed out or I'm feeling a bit under the weather or you know I, th I think there's a I, I'm going to keep saying it there's a I believe there's an emotional fingerprint that photographs have um, and they resonate with you at different times of the day and different times in your life I mean I know yourself you know we've, we've both gone through some very difficult times since we first met and mm -hmm. you know these things can should and will impact our creativity 
Uh, I had a wonderful comment oh, from a, a wonderful comment from a lady today who was saying, "Oh, when she, she when she goes out to shoot straight after work, she feels very stressed and she doesn't feel very creative." And I said, "Well, that's the perfect opportunity to find different types of things that resonate with you when you're in that mind space." Uh, yes, you know, creativity can take many different shades. Uh, so, uh, this is what I love about these conversations: is that we're we're, we're very similar in many ways, but creatively and expressively, we're quite different. Uh, yes. But we're, we're using the same language and we're using the same tools and we're using, um, we're using how we feel about the landscape to, I think, first and foremost, satisfy our own love of the landscape and our own kind of self-development. But equally, as soon as you put an image out there, it becomes the property of the world uh, and, right. and other people can have a relationship with it that's either, well, I love that and I, I, that resonates with me or no, I, I, I don't like that and I don't want to look at that person's photographs anymore. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> yeah, no, well, good points. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, listen, we, we should wrap this up because otherwise we, we could be sitting here all day we'll talking. We'll be here next week. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, for those of you that want to, uh, I'll, what I'll do is I'll, I'll put a couple of these images that we've processed. I'll put them on YouTube so you, if you want to watch them. And also uh, for those of you that are membership, or have a membership with my channel, I'll also put uh, a couple of those for you to look at with the raw files. That's the advantage uh, to going to my membership page and paying a subscription is that you get to play around with the raw files. So if you want to do that, I'll definitely post those up. So thanks ever so much, Alistair, for talking with me again. It's always a pleasure. And uh, well, I was, ho I was hoping to see you in May, but that doesn't look like that's going to happen. So it'll have to be in November. Is it November? Well, we've, we've, got, we've still got Spain in September. Uh, oh, that's right. September, Spain. Yeah. Uh, yes. Hopefully that will take place. But uh, after that, we've got November as well. So, Yes. So thanks ever so much. I appreciate it. And uh, for those of you that want to go and check out Alistair's channel, I'll leave a link down below. Be sure to check out uh, all of his great videos. All right. Cheers, thanks, everybody. Man. And uh, if you enjoyed this, please be sure to give me a thumbs up. And don't forget to subscribe if you enjoy the content of my channel. All right, bye for now. Thanks, guys.